they saw and what they experienced uh, in this journey. So uh, Bob Jansen led our team, and I'm going to have uh, Bob just share for a, uh, a few moments first. Thank you. Uh, please bear with me. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all your prayers. Um, we couldn't have did it without them, and I definitely felt them as we were down there. Um, we weren't sure what to expect, um, but uh, the Lord was definitely with us. I don't think we suffered as much as a scratch, and uh, it was just an awesome time. Um, we did a few different things. We, uh, we did demo, we re rebuilt, we uh, restored and um, landscaping, and we dedicated homes. Um, I guess some of my favorite were the um, rebuild and the demo work. Um, love tearing things apart, so it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, we also, like I mentioned, we dedicated some homes, and I'll let these guys talk a little bit about that, but it was uh, really neat the way you go in. And a lot of these people hadn't seen their homes in months, and the last time they'd seen it, it was completely destroyed. And uh, they come back, and um, they've got, in some cases, a brand new home, some cases just a rebuilt, but uh, um, just the emotion that was shown, it was definitely a tearjerker. And uh, um, these people are so blessed, and uh, the awesome thing is they gave God all the glory which uh, made it even sweeter. Um, opportunities, if any of you have thought for one minute this might be something you want to do, um, I encourage you to research Samaritan's Purse. Uh, take a look at their mission statement. Um, just an awesome, awesome organization. Um, they really take care of you. Uh, if I had any complaints, it would be the fact that I think I gained weight um, they, they feed you really good, um, got a nice warm place to sleep, uh, nice hot showers, and, uh, just a super, like I say, a super organization. Um, uh, the only thing, the only requirement for Samaritan's Purse is to have a willing heart, um, just to want to serve, reach out into the community and serve people there, um, just to be God's hands and feet. And uh, it's just an awesome thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, just reaching out into the community. Um, the one thing that, uh, if I was to take anything away, uh, what really meant a lot to me was how our team gelled together. Um, we lifted each other up. We prayed for each other. It was just an awesome time. Um, just uh, getting together with these people. Um, we've, we even met uh, quite a few friends from Idaho. Um, that being said, uh, I'd like to mention uh, about uh, this. Well, when I first got here uh, Sunday morning, uh, John was talking about Boudin. I don't know if any of you know what Boudin is, but uh, that's all you talk about, all the way up and all the way back. Uh, Come on. <laughs> but... Uh, he even got uh, the, the team from Idaho interested in what uh, Boudin was, so they actually went out to dinner with us one night, and we all had Boudin. But uh, it was kind of funny because after maybe the second day, John started developing this Cajun accent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it was we had a lot of fun on, on top of everything else. Um, but uh, again, I would strongly encourage if this is something you might want to do, uh, research it, and uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, you all know me as John, but down down the boot, I'm boot and John. <laughs> and uh, we had some fun with that, guys. But uh, I just love uh, different, you know, regions and how they talk different. I just think it's cool. But one cool thing is that we had the same spirit of God, and you can go down there, and uh, we served the same God. They had the same spirit of unity, and it was just cool. Uh, something special happens at Samaritan's Purse, and you, they do everything in Jesus' name. We pray um, <clears throat> over everything before we go out, and um, just everything they do is Christ-centered. You know, they say that we go down there to um, 
restore lives. And in the meantime, we build a house and uh, it's really cool. And if there's ever, you know, the community comes in and someone like, wanders over and talk, we stop all the work just to go pray and to ultimately, you know, if they don't know the Lord, witness to them and share the gospel. And um, everyone's just, like Bob said, one accord. Everyone gels so well together. We uh, were one of two teams. One was from Idaho. And uh, they were funny. They kind of had that uh, Upper Peninsula Canadian accent. And we talked to them. They were cool, kind of farmer type people. And uh, before, we, before we left, we're exchanging information and hugging and, and praying for each other. And uh, it was just w really cool. And one of the guys in my room, his son's going through drug addiction. And um, that did flooring, like I do. And um, just got to, to share with him and um, encourage him to, to stick with it and that, you know, he can get through it, you know. So it was, that was a blessed time. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's just an emotional time. Everyone gets to pray together. And you go down there to serve and work, and you just end up growing uh, in your faith. And um, it's just a real special time. And, um, and uh, one thing that stood out to me is that we, or that was cool, is that they had dedications. And it was, it's rare to do one in a week, but we got to do five of them. And as you can imagine, it's a real emotional time. People get back in their houses. Some of them, their houses, their families grew up in, generational, you know. And um, in one case, uh, a couple of families, their brother and sister died in the house. And so it's real special to keep it, even if it's, you know, old. And, um, but they were able to restore it. And so that's really emotional. And um, um, they do a whole program. And there's like five different steps to it, but they uh, introduce it, and then they do, uh, I'll, I'll just mention a few, is the, um, they do the bill. They hand in the bill, and they're like, okay, what's this about? And, uh, and it, it's, it's, all, it's all, you know, different depending on what they did at the house. And um, it's like uh, the engineer, or drywall, or flooring, and uh, appliances. And then they hand, it, they hand in the bill, and it says in red letters, paid in full. And then they, um, they correlate that with, you know, what Jesus did for us. And... Uh, we all have a bill of sin in our lives, amen? And um, it's just a real emotional time for them. And um, no matter, you know, the whole list, you know, Jesus pays for all our sins uh, on the cross, and we get to share the gospel in every step through that whole thing and with the community, with friends of the family. And so that was just a real uh, emotional time, real uh, joyous time to celebrate. And another thing is we all lay hands on the house and dedicate it to the Lord. And, and I uh, pray that it'd be a, a beacon of light in that community. And everyone was just so um, warm and inviting down there as well. I don't think we had any negative uh, people the whole time. And we're, you know, we're working in some pretty rough, high crime areas. And everyone was real welcoming. We wear these orange shirts that are kind of twofold. One is to, for safety, obviously. And then another is just they see that yellow shirt or that orange shirt, neon shirt, and uh, know uh, who we are, what we're doing there. And it draws, draws people in to, to see what we're doing and to come in to receive prayer and um, it's just a real special time and i'd just like to thank the church for providing the means to get down there and and uh, of course all your prayers thanks good morning um i didn't know what to expect at this missions trip it was my first and um it was fantastic I'm just gonna say it was fantastic I was with a wonderful team, and the Idaho team, and Samaritan's Purse, everybody in general is just, they're fantastic. Samaritan's Purse is a, a fantastic ministry serving God, and I was so grateful and so thankful that I got a part of that, to be a part of that. Um, leaving here, I'm just going to share with you real quick, I just leaving here, I felt very guilty leaving my family for a whole week, December, you know, the time when... We're busy, and I'm busy doing all kinds of things and getting things together and Christmas cookies and ornaments and shopping and, and realizing that my husband was on vacation that week and I was going to be gone, and oh my goodness, I'm leaving my family. But when I got down there, and then on the first day, we were uh, doing a house. We were fixing a house, and I was painting and, and getting some stuff done, and a neighbor came in. And, and like Bob said, when somebody comes in, everything stops. Everything comes to a halt. And his name was Mr. Robert. He came in and he, he was very thankful for all of us restoring this house. And uh, I even saw him bring some little jello cups to you know some of the people there. And, and we stopped and we prayed with him. But when we stopped praying, he hugged us and he goes, 
I want to pray for all y'all. And he started praying for us. And this was on Monday. And he, and he prayed for our families because he knew we were apart from our families. And he prayed for peace and he prayed for healing. And he just prayed that uh, this would be a blessed time while we were apart from our families. And he gave all glory to God. And at that moment while he was praying, I just felt peace that this is where I should be. This week, it's all about God. I got to take it off of me, give it all to God, and just and say, okay, God, I'm here to serve you. And during the humidity and the sweat pouring down and being on my hands and knees, scraping paint off the ground and, and, and just literally feeling sweat coming down my back and just everything, I said, okay, glory to God. This is unto God. Do my work unto God. This is not for anybody else. And then when we got a chance to see the dedications, couldn't stop crying. And on one of the last dedications, the, the Samaritans team asked our team if we would hand out a journal, if I could hand out a journal. And then they asked Rob if he can pray the dedication over the homes. And what they do in the homes that are being completely restored, they give them a Billy Graham Bible. to be, And, and it's personally, and only they get it. And it's a, a Bible that's just, uh, just a wonderful Billy Graham Bible. But in the process, they give them a journal. And in this journal is all of Samaritan's Purse. Whoever wanted to writes little somethings and scriptures or prayers for that person in that house. And they asked me to be a part of that. And I was like, yes, yes, thank you for asking me. So when I handed it to Mr. Charles, I was like holding back my tears saying, I am so grateful to hand this to you because you are a blessing to us. And he was just an old man and, and Cookie, his, his friend, was there trying to talk and it was just a, a wonderful moment. And I just felt God just good, good and, you know, well done servant, you know. And, and it was a blessed week. I was just saying it was a blessed week. Rob and the, Bob and the whole team, they, the Samaritans perched. I couldn't ask for better ministry to serve. Uh, they have everything well organized, well situated, and like you said, they're just all about prayer. It was prayer through the whole time, and it was just time of drawing closer to God, giving up myself of everything that I am, and just doing it all unto the Lord and for God. And um, I was blessed to be a part of this, so allowing, thank you, Pastor Brian, for the, the van, the comfortable van that we got to drive in, and the vehicles and stuff, so thank you. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of planning goes into a trip like that, and that trip had been planned for almost two months, and then, lo and behold, the events of last Friday took place. So, Jaron, would you go ahead and uh, kill the lights and uh, roll that video for us, please? <laughs> Sirens went off, but it, it hit so fast, you, I mean, you didn't really have that much time, you know. It was so loud, so loud. Trees were falling, houses falling, and it was like a war zone. The ground shook for an hour. The longer it did, the more stuff you hear breaking, the more things are flying around. And you, can hear, you can hear people screaming. And, excuse me. It's just unbelievable. I was trapped at one end of the house, and my wife was trapped at the other end of the house. And we were yelling back and forth at each other, but we couldn't get to each other. And a wall fell on me and the ceiling, and in the other room, a wall fell on her and the ceiling, and we were just trapped for a couple hours. I was covered with blood, and they whisked me to the hospital, and they said, we see your wife, we're talking to her, we'll get her out. And then it was uh, 24 hours before I see my wife again. And she has broken legs, and it's pretty rough. Never thought I'd have to live through something like this. But I'm thankful we're alive, so. Possessions can be replaced, lives can't. So, but he's got to be thankful for that. It's not just me, it's everybody's gonna have to start over. 
Some can rebuild, some can't, you know. It's just unimaginable. We need help. We need all the help we can get. Emotionally, financially. Just, just homeless people. That's all we are is homeless people. We're just all thankful to be alive. We just need a lot of help. We need, we need a lot of help. So we're going to go to Kentucky, and I pray that you would join us. Um, myself and uh, Pastor Jim, I know Bob, we've all done uh, tornado disaster relief before, and it's rough. It is, uh, there's no words to describe the, um, probably carnage is the best adjective I can think of. But what's amazing is even in those dark moments, um, you're able to minister to people, not just unto one another, but when you do a cleanup like that, oftentimes the homeowners are right there side by side, and uh, it's powerful. So we were going to go to Mexico. I was going to announce, you know, kind of what's happening. You know, Mexico was put on hold because of COVID and all that other stuff, and I'll give a Mexico update in the next couple of weeks, what's happening down there with Pastor Juan and what's taking place this year, but um, I talked to Juan this week. I said, hey, with everything that just took place and really almost our backyard, um, we're going to cancel Mexico, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Kentucky. So um, after a lot of prayer, I believe every four to six weeks, we're going to take a team. We're going to partner with Samaritan's Purse, and Mayfield is getting the bulk of the attention and the bulk of the uh, support. Can you turn the lights back on for me, Jaron? Thank you. Uh, but Bowling Green also uh, was pretty devastated as well. Bowling Green, where the location is, is about three and a half hours from here. So we're going to start sending a team as soon as January. So we'll have more information on that. As Bob mentioned, please look at the Samaritan's Purse website. Um, you do need to be physically able to be on your feet all day. You do need to be physically able to lift some weight. Um, there are some physical requirements, and maybe that rules you out and you're bummed, but I want to tell you, no, you can pray, because that's where the battle really takes place. So we'll have more information on dates, but expect a trip in January. We'll probably be gone for four days and three nights and going every four to six weeks, Okay. All right, with all that being said, let's get into the Word of God, shall we? We're continuing our study in the book of Deuteronomy. This morning we're in Deuteronomy chapter 29, so would you please turn in your Bibles there with me? Deuteronomy chapter 29. After the serious and ominous tone of chapter 28 last week, chapters 29 and 30, which we'll study today, are a reminder to the Hebrews of why they are going into the promised land. The Hebrews are going to be used by God for his glory. And excitingly, chapter 30 is really all about prophecy, speaking of the future time when all of Israel shall be saved. And the title of our message this morning is simply, The Hope for Israel. So would you bow your heads with me as we once again bef go before the Lord. Lord, we pray that as we open your word, as we study your word, that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. Father, we're not here for a, a history lesson. We're not here for information gathering or gleaning. Lord, we're here because we need you. And we need to be transformed by your word. Lord, we ask that you would humble our hearts and you would speak to us. Breathe life into these scriptures and apply them into our lives in a way that only you can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The human brain is truly a remarkable miracle. In fact, the latest scientific data suggests that the average human brain has 86 billion neurons, 
400 miles of capillaries and 100,000 miles of axons, which is enough to circle the earth four times, all within our brain. And on top of that, there are more than 10 million synapses that fire. Yet despite those staggering statistics, science also tells us that our short-term memory, memory only lasts between 20 and 30 seconds. No wonder we forget names so quickly. Now we know. See, God knows mankind's fondness for forgetfulness. So once again, God reminds the nation of his faithfulness as they get ready to enter the promised land. Let's read verse 1 of Deuteronomy 29. It says, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Oreb. Now, if you remember from our earlier studies, it was 40 years before this that Israel made a covenant with God. Verse 2 through 4. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. Now, I don't know about you, but oftentimes I think the greatest way to evangelize would be to see more miracles, to see more miraculous events. After all, who could deny God in the face of his spiritual power? But over and over again in the Bible, we see that great wonders and miraculous signs accomplish nothing apart from the supernatural work of God in someone's heart. Verse 5 through 7. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. Now, we've studied all of this at length, so uh, we're not going to review all of this. But we've seen time and time again, ever since the book of Exodus, how God took care of all of the needs of the Israelites, whether it was battles, whether it was manna or quail, and they had the same pair of shoes for 40 years. Ladies, can you believe that? Is that not a miracle? Verse 8 through 13. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites and the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant... And do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you just as he's spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So you can imagine the scene. Everyone is gathered, whether they were an Israelite, whether they were Hebrew, even up to all the slaves. Everyone is gathered for this very serious moment of once again entering the formal covenant relationship with God. Verse 14 and 15, I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. So this covenant with the Hebrew people is going to be a perpetual covenant, not only for those in attendance, but for their children and for their children and for their children, all the way up to what the new covenant that Jesus described in the New Testament, the new covenant through his blood. Verse 16 through 19. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt and that we came through the nations which you passed by, and you saw their abominations and their idols which were among them. 
wood and stone and silver and gold, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart. This is interesting wording. Look at that again. That he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart as though the drunkard could be included with a sober. So even though God had taken care of all their needs, clearly there would be the temptation for some to worship these false gods, these idols that were made. And God is warning them that they would not be able to escape the consequences of doing so. Verse 20 and 21. The Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven, and the Lord would separate him from all the tribes of Israel for adversity, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book, excuse me, in this book of the law. Point being, God says, no one can forsake the Lord and escape the consequences that he has defined in his word. Now, verses 22 through 28 reiterate what we studied last week regarding the cursing upon Israel if they turned to false gods. So let's read verses 22 through 28. So that the coming generation of your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land would say, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness which the Lord has laid on it, the whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. 24. All nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? What does the heat of this great anger mean? Then the people would say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods they did not know and that he had not given to them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against this land to bring on it every curse that is written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, in wrath, and in great indignation, and cast them into another land as it is this day. This becomes fulfilled as you study the major prophets and even the minor prophets throughout the Old Testament. Look at what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 22, 8. And many nations will pass by this city, and everyone will say to his neighbor, Why has the Lord done so to this great city? Then they will answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God and worshipped other gods and served them. Again, we studied this in depth last week, so we won't spend a lot of time on it now. But verse 29, I'll tell you, is in my opinion one of the most challenging in the first five books of the Old Testament. Look at verse 29 with me. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So in the midst of God's encouragement for the nation to be obedient in their side of the covenant, Moses gives the nation a principle of how God speaks. First, in verse 29, notice that God never declares everything to us. There are secrets God has and will always have. You and I will never know everything. He is God and we are not. Isaiah 55, 8 says it even more succinctly. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, excuse me, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's wisely been said that never let what you don't know distract you from what you do know. Folks, there are a million mysteries in life, aren't there? 
and most of which won't get unraveled until we get to heaven. And I love the quote that says, what's over my head is still under God's feet. See, as much as I would like him to, God doesn't run his plans by me for approval. I don't understand why. No, I do. And he doesn't with you either, does he? We have to believe by faith that he is working according to his sovereignty. That's what faith is all about. But next, notice in verse 29 that there are things that are revealed. God does reveal some things to mankind. And since God has revealed some of these things, then we must do all we can to pay close attention to what he has revealed. Third, notice in verse 29 that God's revelation is eternal. He uses the word in verse 29, forever. Do you see that? See, God's word not only lasts forever. Folks, God's word is forever relevant. We don't have a lot of whiz-bang stuff here in our fellowship, do we? We don't have contests. We're not handing out gift cards. We're not coming up with a cool new thing. You know why? Because we believe God's word is enough. Because if God's word isn't enough, then folks, is it really God's word? Finally, in verse 29, God reveals these things to us. Why? That we would be obedient to him. See, when God reveals these things, he's not merely tickling some sort of theological itch or satisfying our curiosity about spiritual things. No, God wants us to listen and to trust and to obey and to walk with him in relationship. When we ponder and chew on verse 29, it's very clear. It's a reminder, in fact, to us to not let God's secret mysteries divert us from his clear commands. And so often that's what happens, isn't it? We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Now, as we begin chapter 30, we know that Israel's history has been a legacy of either being blessed or being cursed under the terms of the Old Covenant. But what is about to be discussed here in this chapter is looking forward to the day when all of Israel shall be saved and worship King Jesus. Let's read verses 1 through 5 of chapter 30. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So chapter 30 begins by looking into the future when all of the cursings would be over, and now the blessings would come. We need to spend a few moments as a fellowship discussing a dangerous teaching that has crept into many Christian churches, and it's called replacement theology. Replacement theology teaches that the church is the replacement for Israel and that the many, many promises that God has in the scripture for Israel replacement theology says, are in fact for the Christian church. This is emphatically not the case. In fact, nowhere in the Bible are the terms church and Israel used interchangeably. Now, we are taught from Scripture that the church is an entirely new creation that came into being in the book of Acts, right? The day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit being poured out. 
And the church will continue until we're removed from this earth in the event of the rapture. And we also know from the book of Revelation that during the great tribulation, that the world will be judged for rejecting Jesus Christ. And while that is taking place, the nation of Israel is being prepared through trials, through the great tribulation, they're being prepared for the second coming of Christ. And when Christ returns to the earth at the end of the tribulation, the nation of Israel will be ready to receive him. The remnant of Israel who survived the tribulation will be saved, and the Lord will establish his kingdom on earth, and Jerusalem will be its capital. And with Christ physically reigning as king, Israel then becomes the center of the world, and representatives from all nations will come to Jerusalem to honor and worship the king, King Jesus. This is the ultimate salvation of Israel by faith in Christ, not only spoken of here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, but multiple places throughout the Old Testament. This is important. We can't just skate by this because it can lead to very erroneous teaching. So what I'm going to do is put some scriptures up on the screen for us to read together. Then I'm going to give you other places in the Bible where you can study yourself to confirm, be Bereans, right? Confirm these things are true. So Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury and in great wrath. I will bring them back to this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul, God says. You can also read Ezekiel 36, Hosea chapter 14, Joel chapter 3, all speak of the regathering of the nation of Israel at the end of the tribulation. How about Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14? You can look up on your screen. It says, sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. You can also write down Zechariah chapter 12, Malachi chapter 3 to continue to see this theme throughout the Bible. But look at Paul's words in Romans chapter 11 with me. Paul said, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. All that to say it is critical to realize the promises that we read for the Jewish people are in fact for the Jewish people. God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. Verse 6 and 7 of Deuteronomy 30. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. 
Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. This will be the ultimate fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that we studied in Genesis 12. You remember Genesis 12, verse 3. God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verses 8 through 10 of Deuteronomy 30. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now we know that the nation of Israel was formed once again on May 14, 1948, and we know that there are many Jews back in the actual physical boundaries of the land of Israel but not the majority of the Hebrew people. But the Bible tells us there is coming a time when God will gather all of the Jews together from every corner of the world and bring them back to Israel. And when is that time? Jesus tells us in Matthew 25. You can look up on your screen. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from among the goats. So I encourage you, if you're taking notes in this section, to also write Matthew 25. It's when Jesus judges the nations. So, with a promise of what will take place in the future, Moses brings it back around to God's instructions for the people Remember, they're right on the edge. They're getting ready to enter the promised land. Verse 11 through 14. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? So he's saying, you know, this, the instructions aren't so far away. You're like, oh, how are we going to do this? No, verse 14, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. God gave his commands in very simple terms so all the people could understand and grasp what it was that God expected of them. The famous author Mark Twain once said, quote, It ain't those parts of the Bible I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts I do understand. Let's finish the chapter. Verse 15 to the end. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that command... You, excuse me, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Verse 17, but if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish, You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Verse 20, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. Moses once again reiterates the choice, and we've seen this countless times, haven't we, as we've gone through the book of Deuteronomy the last several months. Love and obey God leads to life, to reject God, to disobey God, leads to death. And for us today, we may say, well, that was to the Hebrews 
you know, over 3,000 years ago, we're not under the old covenant. I'm perhaps not even a Hebrew. It doesn't really impact me. So what's, why do we care? Why do we study such scripture? Why not have a feel-good message? Why not talk about the babe in the manger this morning? Why go through all of this? It's a good question. I don't know. No, I do know. (laughs) Because look what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 with me. We're going to read the 13 verses. You have them up on your screen. Paul, when speaking about salvation, quotes Moses here in Deuteronomy 30. Look at it with me. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Remember, that's why we're not bound by the law. Our covenant is in the blood of Jesus. Verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Deuteronomy flows perfectly right into the Christmas message, doesn't it? We are not bound by the law Because God came down in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And not only was he born, but he died for your sins and for mine. And no longer do we have to go by the Old Testament sacrificial system. No longer do we have to try to earn our favor with God, because you can't, can you? Neither can I. The Bible tells us that our works are but filthy rags before God. We like to impress others with our works sometimes, don't we? Oh, you know what I did this week? God's not impressed. God's not impressed. We're going to go help those folks out in Kentucky. He's not like, wow, do you see those folks are amazing. You know what? We'll remove some sin. No. We're all sinners saved by grace. All because of Jesus Christ. Let's praise him for that. Amen? We're not under the law. We can't earn it, nor could we ever. It's salvation by grace through faith. It means you have to believe. It can't just be an intellectual exercise and say, well, I think I kind of know. No, it's faith. It's trust saying, God, I can't see you. I can't feel you with my hands. But I believe that you died for all of my sins. And because of that, I'm now righteous before God. Isaiah tells us, let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Praise God, there's no snow out there. We're praising the Lord for that. (laughs) But when it does fall, remember that, that your sin is like that in God's eyes. All the blood of the lambs, all the blood of the goats, all of the sacrifices, there was blood everywhere. But because of Jesus, the blood has been shed for you and for me. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you died for us. And Lord, if there is someone here this morning who does not know for certain that they are saved, they do not know for certain that they are saved from eternity in hell because of the refusal of you, I pray that today would be the day, this moment would be the moment where they would call upon you and say, Jesus, I'm yours. Lord, as we plan, as we get ready to 
celebrate this week. We're going to have a whole lot of things going on. Father, would you knit these words to our heart that we remember the reason for all of this? It's Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be a worshipful bunch, that we'd be giving you the praise that you deserve, not just here, but as we go home, as we go about our daily lives, that we give you the honor that only you deserve. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.